Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome once again uh, for taking time out and uh, listening to uh, our discussion, uh, our Saturday discussions. Uh, this week, uh, we'll be talking about valuation of startups from different stakeholders' perspective. Uh, on the panel today, we have uh, th uh, three distinguished guests, uh, one representing uh, the startup side, one uh, from the angel network side, the third from the angel fund side. Uh, we have Parag Sen. Uh, Parag is the CEO and co-founder of Homepect Technologies Private Limited, a company based in Bangalore. Uh, Parag is a professional with uh, business and marketing leadership experience, uh, both in India and emerging markets on international brands in the domains of telecom, banking, and advertising, very varied uh, uh, sectors. Uh, he's a co-founder of Homepect Technologies. Uh, Homepect is a marketplace for SME business to accomplish credit and price discoveries. It's a one-stop shop for funding and procurement. They have raised institutional funding recently, and Parag can throw light on valuation from a co-founder's perspective. Uh, we have Chandrasekhar Kuperi. Uh, we call him, uh, he's uh, popularly known as Shaker. Uh, so that, that's how I'll be addressing him during uh, this discussion. Uh, Shaker is a general partner in Peaceful Progress Fund uh, and uh, he wears multiple hats. Uh, he has two decades of experience in uh, multinational uh, companies across diversified sectors. He's very experienced in the merger and acquisition space, which you call the MA space, uh, having led or been part of over 11 acquisitions and four divestments, including cross-border transactions. As I mentioned, he's a general partner in Peaceful Progress Fund, an angel fund in technology-led and consumer businesses, and he's closely associated with San Angels. We also have uh, Sanjay Shukla, the founder of San Angels. Uh, Sanjay is a strategic business leader with over three decades of global experience in technology and investment management. Sanjay is a co-founder of San Angel Network, investing in pre-seed to series A round in startups. Uh, I will be doing the moderator's role. My name is uh, Sriram, Sriram Chandravadnan, uh, and I'm also a co-founder with San Angels. And in this, I will also be double-hatting as an angel investor. Thank you all, uh, Shekhar, uh, Parag, and Sanjay for joining me. Uh, we'll uh, dive into our session. Uh, Parag, I will start with you. Uh, so Parag, when does I start up or you know, when, when you were uh, uh, looking to raise funds for Homepact, uh, when does the thought arise uh, that you need to go for a, start, uh, for a fundraise? Uh, is the quantum of money uh, the consideration or do you feel uh, dilution, uh, which ultimately leads to valuation, are those the critical factors? Or if we can throw light, we can uh, you know, then uh, get the investor's perspectives. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, thanks, uh, Shilam, for the introduction. Um, see, when we started um, uh, our journey, A, we were already uh, you know, middle-aged, gray-haired people, so very different from the uh, young crowd who have you know, finished their studies and jumped straight into entrepreneurship. So I think there is a difference in the approach of fundraise when you uh, start late in life. Uh, to our advantage, what happens is if you have worked for two, three decades in the industry, you generally tend to have a very strong network of people who could be your sounding board, who could be your mentors. Uh, so what happened in our case when we had the idea, uh, when we kind of... Uh, at the ideation stage, we shared the idea with a few people, uh, largely our bosses, earlier bosses, peer friends, some mentors. And fortunately for us, uh, a few of them had actually uh, straight away committed certain funds along with us. So three founders, we had brought in our capital, but we also had the commitment from about four or five other people, even before we had registered uh, the company. So I think that's the uh, advantage you get if you start late in life uh, because you have the power of network to kind of get you, you know, started off the block. Um, 
but uh, at any case, you know, those are all friends and family funds, small ticket size. It's basically largely to launch you. You can start experimenting with the product. And eventually when you come to the market and launch it, uh, there is no right time uh, for raising capital. In my own experience, I don't know with others. Uh, it largely depends on when you are, uh, you know, started making your business plan and see the numbers and try and figure out that where will you, what kind of, you know, dry powder you have. Uh, I gen we generally follow a, a principle of at least six to nine months uh, at any point in time. And uh, of runway, you must have at any point in time. Now, how do you uh, arrive at what is the right time to pick up? So basically, any fundraise, Angel takes about three to four months in Angel run easily. So you budget that way. That if you have to have six months of runway, what's the right time for you to go out in the market to uh, do it? Uh, generally, all of us tend to become very choosy about valuation. Uh, you know, at what valuation should I raise? What is the you know, after having spent a few years, uh, we have realized that at the end of the day, percentage shareholding valuation, it all depends on how successful you become in the end. You know, uh, at, at the initial stages, somebody is putting uh, money, uh, their own hard-earned money on, in your company, basis largely uh, who you are as a founder and to some extent the potential of the idea, but largely who you are as a founder in the initial stages when you get in. Uh, so honestly, it doesn't matter whether you give 10% or 15% or 20% uh, at what stage. But what it matters is, do you have some people who are patient in funding, who is not going to chase you from day one to you know start showing results? Because it takes time to build a company, to prove the thesis, get traction in the market, and then start you know the growth side. So I would say the right way to right time to choose is any time is right time. Right way to choose is to choose people who you think will stick around with you uh, and i know we, we we can vouch for it because when covid came and everything shut down those sets of first 10 uh, investors actually stood by us they pumped in additional capital to help us survive that 18 months so that's what i would share perfect uh shaker uh, from an investor perspective so what are the most important factors that uh, you would consider when evaluating a startup for investment. Thank you, Shweta, for having me here. You know, good to connect with Parag and Sanjay again. Uh, we look at four M's, you know, which are very important. Uh, you know, when uh, we want to invest in a particular startup, and by four M's, I mean the first is the market, because uh, is the opportunity really big? Is this, you know, really a large and attractive market? that the startup you know, is trying to get into? And will they in the next three to five years create a sizable revenue? Uh, what is important for us is whether the startup also understands you know, whether that's the favorable trend that's happening because timing is everything. What I've realized you know, in the journey of uh, uh, being an angel investor as well as operating this fund is that timing is everything. And uh, the other aspect when I speak about market is, uh, do the founders, do they have a clear competitive positioning for themselves, because that's very important uh, because competition is going to lurk all the time. And therefore the first M is the market. The second is clearly the management, uh, as Parag also rightly you know, said, it is the founding team. So what we look for is, uh, you know, is it a skilled, which means do they have the domain knowledge? At the same time, are they a cohesive team? Because for me, uh, what I've realized is that when there's a mutual respect among the team members, that itself is a big win you know, when you're investing into a particular startup, because probably the ability, you know, to sort of uh, learn faster and even, you know, go through the ups and downs, you know, would be, uh, you know, far uh, greater. But more importantly, when the right opportunity comes, I think uh, the founders, you know, would be ready to go big because that's what we are looking for. So whenever we look for investing in a startup, we also, you know, sort of gauge whether uh, when the opportune timing comes, are they uniquely positioned, you know, to sort of, uh, you know, snatch that opportunity, seize that, you know, opportunity. The third M is very important, which is a model, because I always say that ideas never fail. It's a business model that can fail and therefore revisit the model. And therefore, do they have efficient, uh, you know, go to the market strategy? Have they truly understood, you know, what are, what are the growth channels? And therefore, you know, what sort of omni-channel they should look at? What about monetization? What about profitable monetization? So unit economics, you know, do they understand? 
and uh, the offering itself, how differentiated you know it is. And finally, the last step is the momentum. Uh, I being a Pakka finance guy, you know, I have to look at numbers, and therefore we always you know want startups to also appreciate that the quantitative aspect is very important. So what I mean by momentum is they should have cracked something. Could be a POC or let's say a pilot. Uh, show that you no, know, there is attraction. They should have a business plan, you know, which is credible. Uh, my only concern is that sometimes when it is ambitious, it's more of the hockey sticks, but ultimately, you know, it may not be realizable. So uh, I request, you know, the startups to ensure that, you know, they've given it a lot of credibility. More important is uh, as they are putting together their, uh, you know, runway, is that capital efficient? Because sometimes uh, between working capital and other needs, you know, is there clarity? And finally, when I speak about momentum, I think there must be a strategy which is clear in terms of how long the money is going to last and therefore when is my next you know, sort of race. More importantly, a scenario, like if I grow faster, you know, when, when, what is an you know, opportune time for me to raise the money earlier? Or if things sort of, you know, uh, like the COVID or let's say, you know, the recession now, how do I ensure you know, that my cash runway, you know, last beyond, you know, what, you know, I'm looking at. So these are the four M's, the market, the management, the model and the momentum. Excellent. Uh, anything that you would like to add, uh, Sanjay, given uh, that the network is predominantly made up of angel investors uh, and on San Angels, typically uh, they could even be first time investors. Anything that you would like to add uh, to what uh, Shekhar has mentioned? No, I think Shekhar covered pretty much what uh, <clears throat> uh, we also would look into it kind of thing. Uh, maybe apart from that, we probably would also have a additional criteria like whether it's B2B or D2C. Primarily from the thing that uh, if it is B2C, it needs a lot of marketing uh, money and then it may be a longer uh, duration where you can uh, get money back kind of thing. Uh, most of us, as Shira mentioned, most of the San Angel is a first time angel investor. So we want to make sure that uh, at least uh, in three to four years horizon, at least uh, there is an exit opportunity is there. And which pretty much I think in B2B, it, uh, we believe that it provides um, a better opportunity. And not to say that um, we have not got on our platform um, other models. So we have got D2C and healthcare and other things also. Uh, and that also has been, been well received. We are recently, we had also agriculture based company also was there. But Oh, if you ask of my preference, it will be more B2B, no? Excellent. Also, uh, just following up on that, uh, Shekhar, uh, this is for a, uh, the things that you mentioned is predominantly more for, uh, you know, very early stage startup. How do you look, how do you look at it? Let's say when it comes to a series B uh, or a very large series A round, uh, because some of them that you've covered would have seen more traction. Uh, how do you view uh, this, the next round or a follow-up round or a very large round uh, of Series A or Series B? Uh, it's a very good question, Shriram. You know, so when it comes to the, you know, the, the larger round, you know, which, which uh, basically is a growth capital, I think what is relevant for us is for what milestone is that being raised? So is it you know, for venturing into a new market or you know, is it uh, you know, an additional product launch or, or is it, you know, like, you know, uh, the business is uh, getting into, you know, a, co a complementary sort of stream. So I think what is relevant is uh, the need of that particular fundraise. And at that time, Shriram, I'll be very uh, open. We also look at, you know, what sort of other investors who are coming in. Because uh, we also need to, as a fund, we also need to ensure that, you no, know, we are able to understand uh, who would be the lead and what would be, you know, their motivation in terms of, you know, adding the support. Because... When it comes to the next next round, the higher rounds, it also depends in terms of what strategic options these guys are looking at. And I think uh, to Sanjay's point, the exit at that time you know becomes extremely relevant because uh, 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 you know we are an angel fund, and therefore uh, uh, whenever we invest in a in a Series A or Series B, we're very mindful of you know what is the sort of timing that we would have on the exit. And therefore, for us, what is relevant is uh, you know for what the fund is being raised. Who are the other investors, you know, who are coming in? And more important, you know, from an exit strategy, you know, what is it that this is uh, leading to? Uh, but more importantly, you know, whenever it comes to a higher round, I think what we are looking at is, uh, you know, what is, uh, you know, the true motivation for the founders to ensure that, you know, the, the, the money that they're raising 
you know, for how long that is going to last. Because one of the concern that we always have in a bigger round is you can't raise, uh, you know, another bigger round after you've raised, you know, uh, you know that, that level of round. So the question is, you know, how well are they looking at uh, the runway that round is going to get them to or exactly, you know, what purpose, you know, uh, you know that, that they are uh, letting us know in terms of delivering, you know, that purpose. So, so that would be the significant factors to look in. Sure. Just uh, uh, as an investor myself, uh, you know, when I look at uh, uh, the factors, I, I would like to add that when I'm looking, when I'm considering uh, an evaluation uh, of a startup, uh, initially the thought process was not there. It has uh, developed over a couple of years of investing in startups is uh, the exit strategy. So, uh, you know, uh, initially it used to feel uh, I've not even entered the uh, startup, uh, the startup uh, in terms of funding. And here I am thinking about exit. I mean, how can someone think about exit? But over a period of time, I have also you know, uh, experienced that exit strategy also needs to be worked out. So you know exactly where, you know, when the next round of funding or whether there could be a strategic tie-up or you know, uh, the business could be throwing up cash such that you could you know, go and acquire a few more uh, companies. So uh, that is another thing that I have built over a period of time, which I used to be cheesed off. Uh, you know, if I were a founder, I would say, what is the exit strategy? It would put me off. But today I realize, uh, because of experience, why these things are uh, being, uh, you know, spoken. Uh, we have a question from Sridhar Reddy. Uh, please pardon me if I'm not pronouncing it uh, correctly, but Sridhar, uh, uh, his question is at prototype stage, what all factors angel investors would see to take a call on investing in MVP, uh, where he's defined his total addressable market time at uh, $181 billion. Uh, Sanjay, you would... Uh... Sure. <clears throat> so, Sridha, first of all, congratulations and welcome to entrepreneurship uh, domain. So, uh, yeah, it's an interesting question. And uh, typically, I would say that uh, when we go from uh, prototype stage, which I would say is the very, very early stage, typically, uh, prototype stage is something which is get funded either by the bootstrap or uh, by the friends and family round. And reason for that is very simple. As you move along, as I think Sriram was mentioning about uh, Series B, Series C kind of thing, the when you are in a prototype stage, you don't have any quantitative data to prove the product market fit kind of thing. Correct? You you have all the quality data. Your idea is great, which everybody says. Um, market size is huge, everybody says. Correct? So what differentiates you from others for that, and why investors should invest? So that's maybe something which you need to think about it kind of thing. No. So I'll just give you an example. <laughs> Typically, we look at the companies which are uh, uh, um, at least a revenue of uh, one to two crores uh, ARR is there. But recently, we, we uh, put a company which was uh, uh, early stage, uh, pre-revenue stage. So there are other factors are there. One factor is obviously the qualification and the experience of the founders. So if uh, in this case, founder has got 30 years of experience, he has got three patents on his name, which tells us something. He has got a couple of successful business behind him and he's starting a new business. Again, that one more uh, tick mark. And most importantly for uh, uh, current uh, startup, even though it's a pre-revenue, he already have the partnerships with a large telecom uh, providers. Now that gives us at least a comfort level that, okay, the even though revenue is not there in the few months when as soon as this particular thing kicks off or with the partnership the revenue will start in so these are the other parameters which you need to look at it if you are going and approaching the angel investors no uh, otherwise just if it's around the mill it will be difficult uh, because i think the key thing is we have to differentiate uh, with other startups which are uh, also at very early stage and which also at the prototype stage no? right want to add something uh yeah, just quickly, uh, just three things. You know, one is as a, as an investor, I think what we want to understand at that early stage is what is the problem and therefore what solution is being offered? Because we always say that a problem well-defined is a problem half-solved. So is Mr. Shridhar, you know, trying to help us understand that there is a large problem, a problem, you know, that is still, you know, under and therefore, you know, the business can do that. 
that's the first. The second is being an MVP. I would uh, you know, request him to at least consider certain early adopters as customers because we want to hear what sort of feedback you know, he's getting you know, from the customers. I think that's very, very relevant because that gives us the confidence in terms of what's happening on the ground. Because to Sanjay's point, you know, the product may not be absolutely fit for the market to be launched. That's why you know, it's still at an MVP stage. And finally, as an investor, what we look in is because the funds are being asked, we want to understand, you know, at uh, the the different elements in terms of why the fund, you know, usage where where the fund usage is. So I think the usage of funds is very critical because at that stage, you know, we want to understand. Also, understand, want to understand the runway and when is the next fund, you know, that they're going to raise because that helps us in our mind to understand how you know we should consider the funding. Whether should we even up the investment based on you know, what we are hearing. Sure, Parag, uh, from a founder's perspective, uh, have you faced something like this, uh, this dilemma where, you know, MVP stage, how the very early stage, how will I get my uh, funding, uh, the right amount, the right amount, you, you may get 50, 60%, but you may not, you know, you're not a factor for that. Uh, you, you also mentioned that uh, the experience that you had uh, ensured that you had a network that, uh, and you had some uh, initial funding to see through six, nine months, which you had factored in. Can you uh, share a few experiences? How, uh, I mean, what went through you and uh, your co-founders minds uh, that can maybe, you know, address Sridhar, uh, uh, Sridhar Square a bit from the other side? A uh, couple of things, you know, the, uh... We had a little unique journey, as I said, because we had some bit of commitment. But uh, that is one thing to have some commitment uh, at an idea stage. And then when you come down to the market research, get the numbers, sit down and start shopping the business plan. That's when the, as uh, you know, Chandrasekhar also said, the numbers start, you know, forming an opinion as to where we are, what the scale, size, opportunity, uh, challenges of the industry. Uh, many things change after those numbers are put in perspective. That what kind of scale of money would you need? How often would you need? What's the uh, frequency you would need it? Um, the uh, challenge which we faced, of course, in India, because back in 2016 17, we were talking about a B2B uh, uh, in a marketplace solution. Uh, we felt in the initial two, three years that we were ahead of the curve because. India was predominantly a B2C market at that point in time. Uh, it even, even now, it is largely predominantly B2C. Uh, very uh, small portion of the total available fund pool is available for B2C markets in India. And that's the hard truth. So as founders, if you are actually working out a very niche uh, ideas or spaces, you need to then uh, you know, do a different strategy because what we have realized is that all investors are not for every startup. There is a DNA match which happens between investor and uh, a founder. And I think one of the earliest lessons which founders must learn is to how to figure out that which investors would be good for us. That is very important because every investor, and there is nothing right or wrong in this, every investor has their own thesis, has their own thought process, has their own belief, uh, the way they want to uh, you know, take out uh, opportunities and invest in them. We may not fit in their, uh, you know, uh, their entire story. We just may not. We may be a good idea. We may be a good opportunity, but it just doesn't fit in. Sometimes it could be also a, a, a mismatch in the personalities involved in both sides of the table, the, the founders versus the investors. So I think it is important for first-time uh, entrepreneurs to know, learn the uh, tactics of identifying which are the good funds to chase from, and I think that is where experience comes uh, little handy when you sit down and when you do meetings to try and figure out what are the uh, you know final nuances are. These can't be taught in classrooms. This has to be only learned as you go through. That's why mentorship is very important. Even if you're a first-time entrepreneur, three things I tell that very important you need to do. One is get a very good chartered accountant, an extremely expensive lawyer. Don't look for cheap lawyers, and uh, a, a mentor who is uh, you know really can give you certain valuable lessons in life. Because you as a 25-year-old, 30-year-old, you may not know the nuances of how to run a business, what to do. You may have a very great idea, but how to convert that idea into a market opportunity is not what you are trained to do. So you need to have somebody who can guide you through the process. Uh, 
those are the important things. So, so the other thing which I have realized, and I don't know how much uh, Shekhar would agree with me on this, that in my experience in the last six years, what I have seen is that, uh, uh, and I think we have done more than 100 odd pitches. Uh, we have got rejected possibly 50, 60 times in different levels. Uh, I have a feeling that there is a scope on the investor side to improve the um, quality of the evaluation process. So basically because investors get so many proposals, ultimately there are, uh, you know, filter process, right? So there would be analysts, there would be people second round before it goes to the investment committee. But by the time it goes to the investment committee, I feel that, uh, you know, People with a little more experience who are at the, at the doorkeeping stage would possibly help because there are a lot of times I have realized that uh, a young mind may not have the wisdom or the experience behind identifying the opportunities. I'll give an example, very simple example. Uh, we have faced uh, because we are in the B2B. Now the metrics which you chase in a B2B is very different from B2C. But the minds of the people are so tuned to B2C metrics that they just don't know how to appreciate a B2B metrics. For example, our average order value would be very high, 11, 12 lakhs. We have possibly a thousand rupees on a B2C. So consequently, we will have very less transactions, right? But the general approach is that, oh, your number of people who are transacting are very low. But that's how B2B industries are, right? That, that's how the market operates. Uh, for example, we operate on very thin margins because that's how it's, it's a large, it's a volume game in B2B side. You will do a lot of transactions, you'll pull through, your margins will not just come from, uh, the good thing is that in a B2C market, there is only one revenue stream, whereas in B2B, there are opportunities to do two, three revenue streams. So there are other ways of doing. So what I intend to say is that I think I felt, personally, I felt that there is a great need for uh, in a little more wisdom and experience when new ideas are being evaluated before it reaches the you know decision-making stage. Because a lot of the good ideas are get you know, missed out. Uh, my, and, and some numbers, you know, are, are, are showing there because last year, if you look at India had about 25 billion uh, in investment out of that, about 4.1 billion came from for early stage, right? Uh, and 22 billion came in the late in the states. Now, if you look at the number of deals, that's about 1,000 and 1,012. So uh, average ticket size of a seed stage also is $4 million. That's a lot. So which means if you look at the numbers, that even the early stage funding, even the seed stage funding in India is not happening at the ideation stage. It is happening only after traction has been built up. So I think I don't think that's that's good for the whole ecosystem. There has to be a lot of hundreds of ideas were funded with fifty thousand, eighty thousand dollars, you know, before they move into the. So when it shows the large, I mean, even a early stage ticket size, the average ticket size, I'm saying at four million dollars, is tells me the story that not enough funding is happening in the very, very early stages. People are little risk averse in, in, in Indian economy, I would say that. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so it's a, it's a mix. I mean, uh, we are also trying to find the right mix, uh, whether stars seed funding, at what stage gets funded, uh, follow-up rounds are more, uh, you know, where people know uh, about the startup. So the investors look at it from that perspective that, uh, Money goes into follow-up rounds. That's why the four million and the twenty million, uh, you know, uh, differences four billion and the twenty billion. Uh, Sambath, uh, who's uh, founder and CEO of Pattu Tadam, uh, I hope you got that uh, addressed because it, uh, we just spoke about the metrics uh, that are required to get funding uh, for pre-revenue stage startups. Also was covered in that. Uh, uh, Siddhaya Swami has uh, asked if the idea would be validated with the 50k users and if promoters looking for seed stage, seed stage funding, is it feasible to get the investment? Again, it's all a mix of, you know, all the other things that we discussed. Uh, Shekhar mentioned the 4Ms, uh, Sanjay put across uh, B2B uh, and, uh, you know, some of the exit strategies that we spoke about. So, uh, validation with 50,000 users, uh, again, uh, Parag also mentioned that you know uh, the number of transactions that he would have had would be less, but the value would be uh, uh, will be high. So fifty thousand users need not necessarily you know be feasible to get the investment. Uh, yeah. But yeah, at least you have a start. You should be able to you know uh, speak with that much more confidence about market and the customers that are available. 
next, uh, just moving uh, ahead, uh, uh, Shekhar. So, uh, how do you balance the desire to invest in a promising startup uh, with the need to manage risk as an angel investor? But I've always said, you know, that uh, angel investment is very addictive. And therefore, you know, one has to be extremely careful in terms of how one reviews, you know, the startups and then makes a decision. Right. So I think there are, uh, you know, a few lessons I've learned on the way. And uh, the first important lesson, you know, that I keep telling myself is uh, angel investment is a marathon. And therefore, you know, uh, there's a lot of patience that is required because building a good portfolio, that itself takes time. And therefore, my focus has always been in terms of how do I build a good portfolio so that, uh, uh, you know, whenever you know, I'm looking at, you know, what the portfolio is tracking, I'm at least feeling good in terms of the direction the portfolio is in. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to get carried away by the FOMO, you know, the fear of missing out. So that's what I keep telling myself. So that's one. The second I keep telling myself is it's my hard-earned money, which is what, you know, we are putting in. And therefore, uh, whichever startup I evaluate, I need to have the focus of telling myself that that's the only one that I'm going to do for the time being. And therefore, how much energy and time can I give in terms of speaking even to my peers, the other fellow investors, probably to the founders, you know, and also to some of the other advisors to see, have I truly understood it? Because uh, angel investment can be one of the biggest tuition fee one can pay to learn, you know, how it works. And therefore, you know, I think it's very important that, you know, one does it in a, uh, in a very paced manner, time it out, you know, properly. The third important aspect I learned is, you know, diversify. You know, don't put all the eggs in the same basket is what something that we learned, you know, a long time back. So how do I ensure, you know, that I diversify the portfolio so that I'm able to ensure that, uh, um, I know, I have uh, mitigated the risk. At the same time, you know, probably I'm also learning, you know, in this process. And finally, you know, one of the biggest things that I've learned is uh, uh, don't go by the momentum play because EdTech is shining, you know. Don't just you know go behind it. Take just because consumer is shining, you know. Don't go behind you know the consumer you know segments. Ensure that you no, know, there is this art and science which is balanced out well, and that's how you know you can balance the risk. So one thing is very clear: where there is risk, there is you know reward, and therefore you know you have to take the risk. But then can we apply the art and science in such a way that uh, you know one is not getting carried away by the momentum play? And the final piece that I keep telling myself is: uh, uh, if I come across a good opportunity. And let's say the valuation appears crazy. Okay, I'm not going to get you know bogged down by that valuation because for me the critical factor is is that startup going to show exponential growth? Because if it shows that, the valuation will always you know kick in you know later because it's not a function of you know what number I'm looking at as a valuation. The focus is always in terms of how exponentially can the business you know sort of scale. That's very relevant. So that's how you know you sort of balance it. So so Akash has asked uh, Akash Chandrakar. Uh, so how does valuation work during different stages, you know, idea stage, MVP growth and scale? So is that something that uh, you, you can add on? Uh... Absolutely. Absolutely. It's a very, very relevant question. So thanks to Mr. Akash, you know, for asking that. At, at a very, very early stage, you know, what is important is, uh, you know, it's the, uh, the founders. You know, how do you know, look at the founders? And therefore, uh, the valuation that is being suggested, the only thumb rule that we guys do is, you know, take a multiple on the revenue, see if it is closer to what we understand as the industry standard. And if it, you know, is within the range, we go with that. The other methodology that we use is a scorecard. What I mean by scorecard is you have certain parameters by which, you know, you weigh the founders, the market, the product or the service in the competition, you know, how well, you know, you know, this can scale up. So there are certain criteria, which, you know, which we have. Uh, to be absolutely precise, we have got 10 criteria, which is what, you know, we do internally to ensure that you know, we are able to evaluate that early stage startup. So at a very early stage, you know, what I'm saying is that I think it's all to do with a multiple on revenue or, you know, a scorecard methodology or a combination. That's what, you know, one can use. But as the business scales to the growth stage, you know, or let's say, you know, it is nearing the growth stage, I think this is where the comparable comes in. So we look at, you know, the, the market comparables in terms of the private and the listed transactions. And we also look at uh, the discounted cash flow more, more to corroborate it you know, to understand whether you know, this makes sense. And uh, being a fund, we also use a methodology called the VC methodology, just to see that, you no, know, are we balancing it? So what we call is a football field, you know, which is what we do to ensure that we have different methods and then uh, take, you know, whatever is the, the average range and then uh, make a decision. 
to be honest it's not a it's not something you know that that we are experts you know in terms of evaluating but probably it's a good way for us to you know create a discipline as to how we are evaluating and how you know we are coming up you know with our understanding of the valuation and as i said you know we are not too finicky in terms of uh, you know the valuation what we are more focused is can the business scale up exponentially because that's a, that's a, you know the name of this you know, game of the startup in fact startup is defined as a company that can scale very quickly that's only mantra you know that is there for the startup sanjay uh, any red flags that uh, angel investors look for when they evaluate a startup Yes, so I think uh, one of the things which uh, Shaker mentioned about the valuation and then um, um, we don't look that much valuation on the early stage. And I think I tend to agree with him that uh, valuation is something as an exercise which has got demand supply kind of thing you know, at early stage. You know? uh, valuation is not a really a value of the company. So if you don't have a revenue and still you are getting 4 crore rupees as a valuation, doesn't mean that your company worth is 4 crore kind of thing. It's just that... Uh, what is the demand and supply and how much investor is going to pay. You know? So I think uh, from that perspective, valuation question uh, goes out of the <clears throat> discussion point. I don't think uh, uh, Parag is kind of a portfolio company. I, we never discuss about the valuation part of it kind of thing. Right? That uh, it typically at the stage when we are that and we work with the co-investors, we don't need to look at. But however, having said that, there is always, I think uh, sometimes uh, there are smart founders, though. No? <clears throat> who thinks that valuation is not that critical, so they will put it some 40, 50 times multiple kind of thing. Obviously, that raises a, a red flag. I, I think the second red flag is that uh, part of the due diligence process. No? I think we are very, very uh, strict about the due diligence process. We don't ask our, our investors to invest unless the we are uh, comfortable with the due diligence uh, process part of it. No? Uh, and uh, we have come across uh, some of the founders where uh, uh, DD was not up to the mark or not done uh, to our satisfaction kind of thing done from their internal uh, people and things like that you know, or people them they know they are not the third party kind of thing. Obviously, those all those things are the uh, uh, red flag for us kind of. Uh, the third thing is I think is founding team itself. No, if founding team is depend on the single person everything is he calls the shot and when you we also talk with all the founders also and um, if it is husband wife team and only the it is one person is there only for sake of just to having the company kind of thing it raises a red flag for us kind of thing so so those are the few red flag where we we think that uh, company in if it grows uh, if really grows well even the idea may be good i don't know whether they will be able to scale up or not no and that's what uh, we look at it will that company will uh, be able to manage itself with the growth or not maybe they will be able to manage now but with the growth would they able to manage that's a critical question when we look at the founding team no yeah so basic uh, thought process is you know everybody all entrepreneurs think that well they come up with ideas they think that uh, that's one one of its kind but that's something that we look at also as investors where you know is there a differentiator are they also ran? You know, if it was also ran, then, you know, uh, somebody's already addressed those markets. So those are something that we, we also evaluate as investors. Another uh, thing is, you know, entry barriers. Uh, where typically, uh, if you had patents or if the uh, time to develop the technology was uh, takes a very long time or if it's a very, very niche market, you know, those are things that... that I wouldn't say red flags, but uh, you know those are also thoughts that an angel investor goes through before uh, you know, investing in uh, startups. Uh, yeah, uh, this is very very technical. Uh, I'll come to you, Dipil, uh, because uh, uh, that's a very general question. I'll come to you a little later. Uh, uh, also. Uh, any any discussions uh, since you are a chartered accountant, uh, uh, Shaker? Uh, anything on the convertible notes or uh, the safe agreements in uh, angel investing? Anything that you can touch upon? I mean, from my experience, uh, Shira, you know what I've seen is you know from a convertible perspective, you know the two instruments that are widely being used is the CCPS, which is your compulsory convertible preference shares. And the CCD, which is compulsory convertible debenture, probably you know the Companies Act in this country 
you know is easy you know to resonate with those instruments so the only uh, safe instrument you know that i've heard of is i say which 100x.vc you know they have come up with you know as an instrument uh, convertible note is not popular in this country uh, but then uh, you know for a bridge round i have myself you know executed you know, a convertible note option with one of the startups for investment so what i'm saying is that when it comes to the you know the convertible uh, uh, you know uh, instrument what is popular in india is the ccps and the ccd unlike the us market you know where you would have seen a safe note or a convertible note you know much more being popular and i think uh, you know when parag was speaking about you know which investors you choose i think this is where you know the real art and science comes because uh, the startups need to be very careful about which investors they are uh, you know going after so you know what sort of appetite you know they have you know for even structuring the transaction for example some of the mid to large size vcs as parag rightly said you know you end up talking to the analyst at, at the beginning stage and uh, with due respect you know the, the analyst would have come from you know certain background but the experience wouldn't be there so it also depends in terms of you know how well you sort of uh, get the right network and uh, speak to you know one of the you know relevant guys and i think i've seen in certain funds you know there could be specialist you know somebody you know would be so closer to a fintech or maybe a health tech or maybe a you know a, a technology you know which is which is beyond you know all this so i think one has to be also you know wary of the fact that you know uh, what, which investor we are reaching out to that also helps in terms of structuring that opportunity now if you come to my fund i think i'm very comfortable only with uh, you know a ccps and ccd as i said i did a convertible note but as a rare case because it was a bridge round clearly i'm not the guy you know who would be very comfortable with a safe note okay so uh, parag uh, you know uh, business model is good the market uh, fit is there your model is liked but valuation could be hitting uh, roadblocks do you look at uh, a structured funding or would you be comfortable only uh investments in equity uh so you know we have uh, a different problem in india in terms of um, trying to create a investment mix in terms of funding whether you know full equity or equity plus debt or now there is venture debt also in india um even cloud funding is coming but what i have seen in cloud funding is largely for uh, i don't think crowd funding is happening in india for business ventures it is largely for altruistic uh, you know purpose so so let's keep out crowd funding per se uh see most of these uh, early stage startups right why they will find difficulty in uh, approaching and getting venture debt is because they will constantly ask the questions and say that how will i fund the debt how will i service the interest cost so as a thumbnail what we have chosen is that uh, when we were like uh, you know let's say 10 15% within the striking distance of operationally breaking even we have decided that's the time we will try and go for uh, venture debt because before that means uh, you will struggle to uh, you know service the debts so that's that's one criteria we have chosen that once we near the goal post we will try and explore that second thing is uh, debt in india is still um, the method of evaluating startups is still the fact that how is your balance sheet looking like in the last 2 3 years now if you are a four year old startup it will always look red there is no way to look black so the formal uh, channels of raising capital debt capital is very restrictive in india unlike in the you know markets like singapore and hong kong uh, there they they have built in flexible products for you to even approach that so those those products are not available in india so i think that kind of perforces founders like us to not look at debt early on in our life so you are then within the uh, sphere of looking at equity right now once you are bottled into equity capital then the valuation game becomes that much more important right at which stage how much valuation you would keep mm-hmm. i'm sure chandrashekar also would vouch that every investor has certain number of uh, you know promoter shareholding percentage as a threshold uh, in in every stage of funding um it's a chicken and egg story right as a founder right let's say 
if you've got a good strategic investor, but you're going to dilute a little bit more, right? should you take the bite and go ahead and do it? Right? So these are the questions founders need to ask that what kind of strategic value that investor will bring in other than being a financial investor. If you can, if that those values outweigh anything else, you should go for it and buy for it. There is nothing, there is no hard and fast in a rule that it has to be certain percentage. As long as you know that you, you have enough voting uh, powers in, in the board, to, you should keep safeguarding that as, as long as possible. Obviously, at a certain stage, you will come below 51%. So that is inevitable, series B or series C. But till such time, you can keep it uh, above 51%. That should be your goal and target. Uh, we have faced these questions ourselves that have you diluted more uh, than should have been. Now, there is no perfect mathematical calculation of what is the right dilution. You evaluate as a founder uh, the opportunity to raise the capital, the cost of the capital, right? And uh, what are you going to do? I think Shekhar uh, you know, mentioned it, that what is the milestone you're going to chase with the capital which you raise? As long as you're clear with that milestone, okay, this is what I'm going to do in the next, let's say, nine months or 10 months. If you are able to reach there, right, even let's, let's say within not the most optimistic way, even if it's reached on an average pace, the multiples of the, the gain will be such that your little more dilution will not factor in. Ultimately, in four or five years, you, if you have to survive the five years period, which is where the trough comes in a startup journey, you need to have scaled up to, let's say, 800 to 1,000 crore any which ways, right? Now, to reach there, whether you have 40% stakeholding or 55% stakeholding, I don't think it matters so much uh, in the long-term journey. If you're in the journey for three years, sell it off and make your money and move, that's a different story. But if you're really long-term focused, that 20% here and there of valuation perspective, your shareholding should not be so much of a concern uh, when you raise capital from your investors. Because at the end of that, they're also putting money, uh, their hard-earned money into your venture. Right. Interesting, interesting perspective. Uh, Sanjay, uh, since you deal with uh, a lot of first time investors on the network, uh, can you share some tips on how uh, investors can increase their uh, chances of investing into or make their first journey as, a, as an investor into a startup? Yeah, sure. So, uh, yeah, it is, it is a, um, I think the, when you, anything you do first time, it's always, there's an anxiety is there. And, uh, it's the same thing is with, uh, first time angel investors also. And I many times say that, uh, when the first time when you are moving your money from FD to the equity market also, even though so much of information is available on the net, you still do it at wrong time. When the market is high, everybody wants to say, ask you, investment kia kia and then you invest in and then market crashes and say this is not for me kind of thing correct mm -hmm. so any 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 asset class you take it and uh, i think that's the challenge which uh, as a journey as an investor we go through mm -hmm. so same thing is true for the for the startup investment also uh, and uh, i think the first thing for is like uh, shaker mentioned that it is a most expensive uh, uh, mba which you can do it with uh, while investing in the startup ecosystem kind of thing correct so uh, that's true. Uh, but as long as you uh, are into it and then you have a long-term commitment to investing in startup, uh, I think those challenges are uh, will go away in uh, first few investment kind of thing. Right? Uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a process of learning, uh, building your comfort level. As Parag also was mentioned that each investor has got their own comfort level. So I think each one of us go through that comfort level. What is my comfort level? How much risk I want to take it? Many times investors, first time engineers ask me, is my investment kar do kya kind of thing, no? Should I invest in this or not? Now, that's a very difficult question for me to answer because if I answer, I'll answer from my perspective kind of thing. And that may not be that investor's perspective. What I do is that I talk to them and I kind of try to make them understand these are the pros and cons of this particular investment. Uh, and uh, you decide that is this pros is uh, good enough for you and is this cons is not that great for you because you can live with it kind of thing. No? And ultimately, it is your choice, your money, and you need to make a final call on that. I can only help you to understand and give you some more insight into it kind of thing. No? So that's, that's the first part of it. The second part, which angel investors, first time angel investors uh, struggle, which is slightly easy kind of thing, is that uh, jargons in the startup ecosystem. No? 
there are too many jargons uh, and uh, when we speak about it i think we take it for granted that everybody knows about those jargons uh, uh, and and that that's the easy part to i think uh, uh, some of those things we can get it on the google we, if you discuss with uh, people in your network i think you can get it but something which you need to understand especially what is the process of investment um, it's not like the equity because sometimes when the angel investor comes from the equity market their thing is just a uh, uh, paying a money and then uh, equity comes into your uh, account kind of it's not that easy as stated for is is that the unlisted security there is a process for that there is a uh, due diligence happens there is a sh uh, shareholder agreement happens in that all the terms and conditions gets defined and the investor should take a pain in reading of that reading between line kind of thing right because many times i've also seen that uh, it's because it's a long piece of document, especially SHG, minimum 15, 20 pages will be there. Uh, people just may want to sign it because they may not have time. I think that that's where the partnership and things becomes very critical that somebody is talking on your behalf kind of thing and making sure that uh, at least the broad parameter that I can, they may not be able to take uh, all the parameters, but at least the broad parameters, broad market practices are taken into account and that's part of the SHA, you know, so that's the uh, second thing. So I think knowing the whole process end to end, when I give, when I, uh, uh, the pitch happens from the startup founders till I get the equity shared certificates, I think that the whole process, somebody needs to understand that before their investment. Otherwise, uh, there may be a feeling that it takes too much time and it, uh, money is my money. I paid the money, but shareholder certificate has not come. Those kind of questions. No, I think if you understand it, then that anxiety level goes down. Excellent, excellent. I think uh, you've been uh, handholding your uh, initial investors uh, accordingly, Sanjay. Yeah. Good to hear that. Uh, quick one. So I just uh, want to take a uh, few questions. I think uh, they will. Uh, you know, we, we covered when does a startup ideally think of seeking funds for business? I think we covered that. Uh, bootstrapped and growing at 100% year on year. Does it even require the onboarding of an investor? Yeah, well, that question typically has to be answered by the founders, whether you need to bring in an investor. Because ultimately, you know, once you bring uh, the investor uh, community in, that it's like a marriage. So, it, uh, you know, it, need to be, it needs to be long term, has to be understood uh, clearly, uh, else it could lead to a lot of angst and pain. Right. See, so, I would say not only marriage, it is also you have a treadmill and yeah. the treadmill speed keeps increasing. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. <laughs> so if you're bootstrapped, growing at 100%, making uh, the business is throwing money uh, and you feel that you're growing at 20-30%, uh, don't want to have investors, it finally develops into a small and medium enterprise uh, kind of business. But if you're looking to grow exponentially uh, now that you're growing 100% uh, year on year, uh, you need to figure out whether you want to bring in an investor or a strategic investor or whether you're good enough to go on your own. Uh, again, pros and cons of onboarding an investor, uh, we covered that uh, now. And uh, if you can correlate to a consulting business and share some thoughts that could be value adding. I think we'll cover that in, the, in, the, in, in a topic uh, which is different because the questions are, uh, you know, here and there. So we'll take that uh, for, for discussion at a later stage. Uh, uh, Vijay Reddy says, when it comes to due diligence, what are the main parameters an investor would be looking at? I think we covered that broadly. Uh, anything that uh, Sanjay or uh, uh, Shekhar in your experience, uh, because due diligence as a process, uh, you know, uh, Again, uh, Sanjay, because you know, first-time investors, and you mentioned these things very clearly. How to bring down the anxiety levels? So anything that you would want to add? Uh, Just quickly, you know, a couple of pointers only, Shriram. You know, whenever it comes to DD, especially at a very early stage. Just for you know, investors who want to become angel investors, what typically we look at is the quality of the management. So we spend you know more time to understand you know, what's the you know the the founders, the co-founders, the, the next level of you know team, the second line of command. You know, we understand that. And the second is the quality of the earnings. What I mean by quality of earnings is, I think uh, in my in the fund that I run, it's it's mainly you know revenue generating. So what we look at is the trends, okay, and then you know do they understand the margin structure, the unit economics, do they understand the working capital, 
do they understand you know the usage of funds you know that's what we are looking at and most important within that is the compliance part because that financial discipline is very important and when the financial discipline is not there of course you know we also want to bring you know certain practices but we don't want to negate simply because you know these guys have not done it so long as you know, it is within the tolerance level we do want to support them and do so that's how you know we do the due diligence very commercial it's very you know uh, oriented towards ensuring that you know we understand the business better and then you know we want to take a call to support the business right yeah i think shekhar put a nice uh, very interesting point that uh, dd has got two purpose first purpose is that does it mean minimum three short level whether business is having a genuine business or not no so that's where the legal and financial due comes uh and more, more importantly it is like if company is to grow what are the other uh, uh, processes in needs to be in place governance needs to be in place so when we look at the due diligence we also look at it okay these are we understand that when startup is there resources are crunched so there would be challenges if if a dd comes 100% clean then we'll be worried correct yeah. so that but what we want to look at it is like uh, is the minimum threshold is met or not and is there a intention is there to if they scale up to meet the other other parameters or not so i think those are two critical things when we look at dd report no if i if i may add uh, shriram yeah. just for the founders that uh, generally as founders we tend to get scared when investors ask for the report right uh, primarily because you know you would have run a very frugal operation there would be a lot of loopholes in terms of compliance in terms of but the thing is that uh, you know i have found most investors as uh, uh, you know chandrashekar also said there is a tolerance level it doesn't mean that you can flout all norms and still expect to get as long as the intention is clear right there are so many technical filings and all these things are required that you will end up missing out here and there unless you have a good chartered accountant and a company secretary you are bound to slip up it's better to um, and what dd does in the process is it actually tells you where have you slipped up because before the dd happens you don't even know that you have slipped up you are completely oblivious of the fact what a dd does is that it makes you aware that okay these are the four or five areas where we need to push up and most of the places it it is a revision process where you can quickly get it done corrected and you know filed and all those things so it is important to go through the dd process without fear b um, a dd process also kind of brings out that um, have you chosen the right partners in terms of your chartered accountant company secretary lawyers that is very very important i keep telling founders we tend to cut corners but please do not cut corner when you are appointing a chartered accountant or a lawyer or a company secretary because those three are the most basic elemental things which you need to focus on if any of those partnerships is not uh, right you will end up making tons of errors tons of errors and the correcting those errors will be so costly many investors may just you know look the other way around because they wouldn't like to go through that painful process so whatever you do when you plan your business model please plan adequate funding for this and we were lucky we sat down with our chartered accountant company secretary and we said that look we don't have revenue at this stage but we will come back and give you the revenue when we start uh, you know generating revenue and we have found people who are startup focused they always give you the leeway we didn't pay our chartered accountant for the first two years of our operations we started paying only in the third year when we started generating revenue so most of them good ones if you go to it they will always give you that leeway and choose wisely and choose uh, you know smartly that who to go with and how to follow a dd process a good dd process will actually make the company much more robust excellent excellent uh, by the way vijay reddy uh, is a director with territory prop tech so i think uh, something in the space that uh, you are in uh, parag just thought i'll bring that up uh shubham gole has uh, asked at what stage we can do secondary exit as a founder and how much it can be and is it okay for the angels and vc yeah again shubham uh, you know you can have various examples again as i told uh, uh, dipil you know uh, depends on uh, what what the purpose is not necessary that you have to do a secondary exit as a founder because once you come down below the 50% threshold then automatically you lose to a, to a large extent you lose control over the company unless it's a very very niche market and you are the person who, uh, holding uh, the reins so be very careful vcs and uh, the angels would look at uh, you know uh, secondary exits for a founder uh, i mean a founder can have uh, some personal needs so depending on what stage what kind of dilution what uh, you know 
the the business stages i think uh, angels and vc would definitely look at it uh, uh, so that uh, there is a motivation for the founder to to keep moving rather than just logging it out and saying that paper valuation is uh, is billion dollars but nothing in my pocket so those are things which vc and uh, angels definitely would look at i think we've covered uh, most of the topic we're also uh, at uh, 8:30 uh thanks uh, gentlemen uh, shekhar very valuable input uh, from the fund side thank you Sarag, uh absolutely outstanding uh in terms of you know how a founder looks at uh, valuation uh, what are things he considers what stage uh you know you also stressed uh, i wouldn't call it a red flag but you said uh, uh, at the initial stage as well as you read it at was then have good chartered accountants have good lawyers network plays a very critical role uh, and sanjay uh, thanks so much for uh, the inputs it uh, definitely should help uh, early or uh, first time investors uh, on the uh, angel funding network uh, we will uh, cover a few more uh, topics in the coming weeks uh, and uh, deepal i'm certain that you know uh, we will address a few of the things because consulting business and value adds uh, is slightly out of topic from what we have uh, uh, in today's uh, session on uh, valuation thank you gentlemen for your time and thanks people thank you everyone thank you thank you sanjay thank you parath thank you shreyam thank you anup and all those you know who are listening today thank you so much cheers for now bye